This morning, I've chosen to speak on a passage I think is familiar to many of us. The author of scriptures, the human writers, as moved by the Holy Spirit, mentioned three kinds of peace in the scripture. You can follow along in your bulletin. The first is peace with God. That comes the moment of our salvation. Romans 5 1 says, We have peace with God. Because prior to our salvation, we were at enmity with God. That's what Paul writes about in Romans 5. We were enemies of God because of our sin. We were cut off, separated from a holy God because of our sin. But through Christ's sacrificial death, we can have forgiveness of sin and we can be reconciled to a holy and a loving God. Second kind of peace that the writers talk about is the peace of God that results from surrendering control of our lives to the Lord. Bob read about that peace in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Simply put, if we yield ourselves to Jesus as our Lord and we bring our concerns before Him, we are promised a peace deep inside our souls, our spirits, that simply defines, defies human explanation. And we'll talk more about that peace in just a moment. The third piece is peace on earth that will ultimately come when Jesus Christ returns to this earth. Isaiah 2, 1 to 4 talks about that time of peace. But in the meantime, know this, peace will not be worldwide because of sin and because you and I live in a broken world, the fact is people will always be at odds with one another. For millenniums, there have been wars and rumors of war for thousands of years. But some glorious future day, the Bible tells us that all wars will cease. Part of our focus this Sunday morning before Thanksgiving is on the peace of God. It's a peace that is available in the midst of trials and tribulation. And here's the reality. We could start right up here and work our way to the back, start in the back, work to the front. We all have trials and tribulation. They come in different sizes and different shapes and different intensities. But we all have these trials. We all have difficult times in our lives. Paul doesn't beat around the bush. He says, cease worrying. Stop being anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Now, some of the most sweet, the sweetest, the dearest people I know who love Jesus wrestle with worry and anxiety. They love Jesus and they don't do all these other sins but they're anxious. Repeat after me. Worry is a sin. Ready? Worry is a sin. And that's when I say if you can't think of any sins you do, maybe I say, well, you know what? I, the Bible says don't worry, and I am worrying. That's a sin, and I need to bring it before the Lord. And it's easier said than done. You say, well, pastor, that's easy. Someone very close to me, not my wife, or my daughter, or my son-in-law, and I'll stop there, <laughs> says, you think I want to worry? I said, you worry too much. You're always stressed out. It's easier said than done to stop worrying. We know we're not supposed to worry, most of us, but how do we stop it? How do we prevent ourselves from worrying? Paul doesn't leave that question open-ended. He suggests the key to overcoming worry and anxiety is to have a thankful heart. Why exactly is Thanksgiving so foundational to peace of mind? Why is being thankful so instrumental in having victory over worry? First of all, Thanksgiving calls for looking up. Now, I understand that there are storms in our life that make it extremely difficult to offer thanksgiving. I said difficult, but I want to say not impossible. We had one baptism at the first service. That lady exudes joy in thanksgiving. She has liver cancer. She had it once. She has it a second time. 
She had a liver transplant and got it back, and they told her she's not eligible for a third one because there's a cancer cell somewhere else in the body that led to the second liver getting cancerous. But this lady exudes joy and peace and thanksgiving. Jesus said, we will all have tribulations and trials in our life. If you study in any detail, and I, mean, I think what we have in America today is a revisionist history. Unfortunately, we've rewritten history in the history books so that some of our young people are not being told of the fact that America was founded on Christian principles. But if you study in any detail the first pilgrims to America, you may be aware that they incurred all kinds of hardships. They battled serious life-threatening illnesses. They were lonely. They were homesick. And nearly half died their first winter on the new continent. Interestingly, I didn't know this, but as I was studying the first winter, the majority of pilgrims remained on board the ship in which they sailed. They didn't come on land until the spring. And the drought of summer caused them to look up to God for relief. God sent a gentle rain in response to their heartfelt prayers. Let me ask you, when you pray, are you just going through the motions or are they heartfelt? Because James 5, 16 says, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It accomplishes much. But some of us are just blah, blasé when we pray. We're not really engaged because I want to tell you that heartfelt prayer can be really draining. It's necessary but draining. God sent a gentle rain in response to the pilgrim's prayer. And a good harvest led to the first Thanksgiving. The year was 1621 and the place was Plymouth. Anybody been to Plymouth Rock? A couple people were there in the... Uh, first service. I've been there. I'm looking for this great establishment. It's a, a rock with a fence around it. The rock isn't really that big. I'm like, I drove all the way up here to see this little rock. But they were thankful. And it's believed, get this, that that first Thanksgiving turkey was not the main course on the menu. Rather, delicacies like seal and swan and lobster. Also missing from the menu that first Thanksgiving, hard to believe, was pumpkin pie. I know, it's been there forever, and I'm, I'm probably the world's least picky eater. But if I had to pick a least favorite meat, it would probably be turkey, and a least favorite pie, pumpkin. And sometimes I have to have a good memory because when people give me stuff like that, one time I said I, I didn't like fruitcake. And it's a good paperweight, I think because they're heavy. You can put them on your desk. I had someone come up to me that Christmas. I said that and gave me fruitcake, I think just to be ornery. So I have to have a good memory when someone, they bring me pumpkin pie that I say in church, I don't like it. And then what do I tell the people? But today we do well to look up to the Lord, our helper. The psalmist said, he looked to the hills from whence his help came. Psalm 121, didn't we just sing that song? I lift my eyes up. My help comes from the Lord. If we indeed look to the Lord, we can be thankful people. James said that every good gift cometh down from above, from the Father of light, in whom there's no variableness nor shadow of turning. That simply means that God is consistent in his nature. He never changes. And every good gift comes from him. So, how much time do you spend appropriately thank, thanking God for everything that He's given to you? Spend much time thanking Him? Thanksgiving acknowledges, recognizes God's gracious provision. Think about this. It's impossible to complain and be thankful at the same time. You can do one or the other. You cannot be grumpy and grateful at the same time. 
Second direction we look with thanksgiving calls for us to look around. We all have so many blessings, and we definitely ought to offer thanks for them. Psalm 103 is a beautiful psalm. It's often referred to as a psalm of thanksgiving. Verse 2 says, do not forget all the benefits of the Lord, the benefits that He so graciously showered us with. You say, well, pastor, what benefits are you talking about? I'll name just a few. First of all, our salvation. The fact that we can have forgiveness of sin, that we can be adopted into God's forever family. Our daily health. Don't take that for granted. I said last week I like to work out. There are those days I'm on the treadmill, I'm going, wow, this isn't fun. This isn't pleasant. But then I think of other people that would love to have the health to do that. That's what I thought of this Friday when my son-in-law was, here's our arrangements at our house. We all live together. We're like the Amish. We just live together. But they're upstairs, and once in a while I let them come downstairs. But the arrangements was, I'll take care of the grass because I like cutting grass. Jeremy, you take care of the snow, the shoveling, because I hate that. So the first snowstorm, where is Jeremy? He's at a conference in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> and I'm out there shoveling and saying, Lord, thank you for my health. And then I see my neighbor lady across the street shoveling and grunting, and I'm going, I don't see her. I don't hear her. I'm going over there now. Thank you, Lord, that I can shovel her out too. Not only that, she told me where to put the snow. Put it out there in the road. It's like, hey, I'm here to help you. Don't tell me where to put the snow. I have my own system. Thank the Lord for your health. For food and a wide variety and abundance of food. For your family and friends. For the Word of God that we have so accessible when many nations you're not allowed to have the printed Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit as our teacher to help us understand the Scriptures. We have shelter from the elements of weather. We have cars that we can get around with. We have the incredible freedom to worship where some people couldn't do this out in the open. They have to go underground. And even going underground, they're literally putting their lives on the line, and if caught, they'll be imprisoned and separated from their family if not put to death. We have the privilege, we can be thankful for, of communicating with God one-on-one -on -one through prayer. We don't have to be anxious because God makes His blessings available to us. A beautiful old hymn says, what a friend we have in Jesus. And some of the lyrics are this, oh, what peace we often forfeit, and oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So you and I do well to start our day communicating thanks to our Heavenly Father. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7, the Apostle Paul asked a pointed question. Here's his question to each one of us. What do you have that you did not receive? The Lord gave it to you. You have health. You have a sound mind. You have skills. You might have sharpened those skills. You might have a sound mind and you used it, but God gave you that. Whatever it is that you have, it is a gift graciously given to you by a loving God. And when we offer thanksgiving as we pray, we are expressing <coughs> that we anticipate receiving answers to our prayers. We, James says, pray in faith believing. Some of us just as wishful hoping. I don't think anything's going to happen, but I'll pray anyhow. That's what amazes me when we say, pray for this, and then we go to the prayer. You'll never guess what happened. We were praying for it. Why wouldn't we guess? Well, that tells me we weren't expecting an answer. Thanksgiving third direction calls for looking ahead. Doubt causes us to cringe and to cower in fear and uncertainty. We are often, many of us, living in the what-ifs of life. People are always, what if this happens? And then what if that happens? And we all wrestle with different things, and I'm like, let's not go down that path unless we have to. And if we have to, then the Lord will help us, and He'll equip us. 
we are so preoccupied and consumed with thoughts of what tomorrow may bring. Faith, on the other hand, welcomes tomorrow with enthusiasm and optimism. So take a moment and take inventory of your life. Are you looking at the future with optimism or pessimism? Are you excited about the future or are you a gloom and doom person? Are you fearful of what the future may hold or are you eagerly awaiting what lies behind the curtain? Thanksgiving allows us to believe the yes, bed is yet to come. And so that's true for the child of God. The best is yet to come. The Lord willing, in January, I'm going to start a series basically one minute after you die. What happens to you? Because you need to know and you need to be prepared for the future. And if you're a Christian, you don't have to fear death. Read the Bible. We win in the end. Following along in your bulletin, Thanksgiving increases our faith. We've just stressed that focusing on God's blessing will make us positive instead of negative individuals. Now, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. So what does that mean? I mean, you're a young person in school and you just close your eyes and the professor says, hey, open your eyes and listen to me. You say, no, I got to pray without ceasing. I'm praying. Does it mean you go to work? You sit at your desk or your place of employment and your boss comes in and says, what are you doing? You're supposed to be working. I'm praying because my Bible tells me to pray without ceasing. Here's what it means. Have such an attitude in your heart that when God brings something to your mind, you can pause and pray right there. Someone that's sick, someone that's having surgery, someone that has relational problems, someone that has financial problems, you can just pause and pray right there. And Paul also said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, be thankful in everything. And he tells us why. Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. People say, I just wish I knew God's will. It says, give thanks in everything. So, are we giving thanks as God commands us through his servant Paul? When it comes to our prayer life, many of us are out of balance. Some of you know the acrostic it spells acts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And I am convinced that we have the last letter down to a science. We perfected that, the supplication part. But how much time do we spend adoring God, praising Him, confessing our sin, offering Him thanksgiving. Thanksgiving should be a vital part of every prayer. Commentator Henry said, we must join thanksgiving with prayer and supplication. Giving thanks for what we've already received builds faith for future blessing, for answered prayer. George Mueller, who founded an orphanage, made the commitment to always depend on God and not to ask other people for help, but to pray. And here's what he said. He referred to trials as the food of faith. He saw trials as a reason to exercise faith, causing his faith to grow. Fifth, Thanksgiving can and does improve our health. The classic writer A.W. Tozer wrote that Thanksgiving has great curative powers. The British pastor Charles Spurgeon said, giving thanks is good ethically, for it's right. It's good emotionally, for it thrills the heart. Here's how Solomon rendered it in Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine. Instead of complaining about tough times, a heart that's experiencing the peace of God sees these difficulties as part of God's beautiful design for his life. Stress cannot remain in a thankful heart. Peace overcomes stress. So let me ask you, you recently tell people, I'm all stressed out. I'm just over the top. I'm about ready to collapse and burn. I've, I've about had it. If you have a thankful heart, that shouldn't be the case. If you practice thanksgiving, you can have strength renewed every day. And especially during those difficult times. Sixth, Thanksgiving creates a desire to be like Jesus. 
Jesus set the supreme example of one with a thankful heart. Repeatedly, in the four gospel narratives, we read Jesus expressing thanks to his heavenly Father. In Matthew 11, 20, 25, he offers thanks to God that he has revealed his will. Thank you, Father, that you have revealed your will. John 6, 11, Jesus takes the little boy's lunch that was consisting of five small barley loaves and two small fish. What did Jesus do when he took that? He gave thanks to his Father, not only for the small amount of food that he had been given by that little boy, but also for what God would enable him to do in feeding the 5,000 from that little lunch. Matthew 26, before Jesus distributed the bread and he had the disciples drink from the cup in the upper room, he gave thanks. Think about this. When Jesus was in Jerusalem's upper room on the night of his betrayal and subsequent trial, Jesus would introduce the ordinance we know as communion, the Lord's Supper, Holy Eucharist. And when you realize how things would begin to unfold and what the elements of the bread and the cup symbolize, it's mind-boggling to think that Jesus there in the upper room would stop and offer thanks. Because Jesus said, this bread is in remembrance of my body, which is broken for you. And he said, nobody takes my life, I lay it down. And then Jesus said in the upper room, this cup represents my shed blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sin. Think about it. Knowing that he was about to bear the weight of the sins of the entire world on his own body, and knowing that he was going to experience the full wrath of God against sin to the extent that he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus gave thanks. How could he possibly give thanks? Because it says in Hebrews that for the joy before him, he endured the shame of the cross. What joy? The joy of knowing that you and I could be saved through his sacrificial death. He gave thanks. He was grateful, Jesus was, that his death would be the fulfillment of the promise of a redeemer. He was thankful that it was his substitutionary death that would make it possible for us to have forgiveness of sin and to become a child of God. In John 11, verse 41 and 42, Jesus is at the tomb of his very dear friend Lazarus, and he offers thanks before he brings Lazarus back from the dead. Here was his prayer, Father, I thank you because you've heard me. I know you always hear me when I pray, but I say it now for the benefit of those gathered here. Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, and he wanted those eyewitnesses to know that Jesus had full confidence that God would give him the power necessary to raise his friend from the dead, to do that miracle. In 1 John 2, 6, the Apostle John says that whoever claims to walk, to live in Christ, must walk as he did. That should tell us that we also should express prayers of thanksgiving. If Jesus did, how much more should we? One of my favorite stories is Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, where Jesus heals 10 lepers. And how many came back to thank him? One. He was a Samaritan. The other nine were Jews, the least likely to come back. And what did Jesus say? This guy came back. And he said, I have to come back. My life's radically changed. I need to go back to Jesus and thank him. And Jesus said, well, wait a minute. I'm pretty sure I healed 10 of you. Where are the other nine? Are you the only one who's bothered to make the effort to say thank you, friend? When's the last time you offered heartfelt thanks to the Lord for all he's done for you? Take some time this Thanksgiving and reflect on all that God's done for you, all that he means to you, and imagine your life without the Lord and everything that he's done and given to you. Sometimes I watch people and go through what they go through in their life. I'm like, I don't know how they cope. That's why they turn to alcohol. That's why they turn to drugs. That's why they have other addictions, because they're not turning to the Lord for the peace that he wants to give them. Next, thankful people rejoice in what they have. Hebrews 13, 5 says, be content with what you have. Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content, Philippians 4, 11 and 12. Paul was continually thankful. He said, I know what it's like to have little, and I know what it's like to have a lot, and I'm content whatever state I'm in. What was it that made him content? It was his relationship with Jesus Christ. Thankful people 
recognize that earthly possessions are temporary. Listen, if you have food and clothes, you are blessed. Thankful people refuse to be ruled by what they don't have. Some folks are consumed by an insatiable quest for more. You can be rich or you can be poor and still love money to the point that money dictates your moods and your goals. Money makes you tick. Paul said, and listen to me because this is misquoted sometimes, Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that the love of money, he didn't say money, he said the love of money is the root of all evil. And it was that love of wealth and money that kept the rich young ruler from giving his life to Jesus in Matthew 19. First of all, he comes to Jesus and says, what am I missing? Here's this guy. He's rich, he's young, and he's powerful. And he said, something's missing in my life. How do I have eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. He said, I have kept them. Jesus said, really? Well, then try this. Go sell everything you have. Give the proceeds to the poor and come follow me. Why did Jesus say that? Because he was showing the man, you haven't kept the first commandment. You don't love the Lord your God. You have other gods, and your other God is your money. And it tells us that man went away sad. He came with a void. He left with a void because money was his God. On the other end, we have in Luke 19, Zacchaeus, a despised tax collector, who met Jesus and gladly gave up his wealth to follow Jesus. Possessions apart or without the Prince of Peace, will never satisfy. Thankful people motivate others to reach out to the lost. Do you have a burden for lost people? Do you desire to have those who are without Christ, apart from Christ, come to them for salvation? A strong enough burden to pray for them and to act as God leads. Thankful people are used by God to bring unity and an atmosphere of love and peace to a local body of believers. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, blessed are the peacemakers. So, as you sit there this morning, are you a peacemaker or a divider? Do you practice the agape love of 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient, love is kind, love is not rude, it's not selfish, it's not arrogant. Thankful people are desperately needed to encourage others. Here's the fact. Society is filled with people with deep hurts. There are countless people today just struggling to hold their heads above water. And they're wondering, and undoubtedly some here today, can I make it through another day? Life has been tough. And if you ask God to make you sensitive to those with needs... I believe that he will open your eyes to people you see every day and you never noticed, you never understood the difficulties they face. I always pray, Lord, make me sensitive. Someone who will remain anonymous came in today. I said, how you doing? Good. I looked at that person. They looked back at me and I said, sounded real convincing. Listen, I want to be sensitive to other people's needs. About a month or two I was ago, someone was walking down the hall back by my office. I said, hey, how you doing? Good. He turned and looked at the wall. And then someone else came the other way and asked him. And I could tell he wasn't okay. And I said, you know what? Come on to my office. Let's talk. And he had something going on in his life. Do you notice people that are hurting? If you're thankful... Lord, show me somebody else that's hurting so that I can minister to them. And I urge you to notice those differences because God has so richly blessed you. Strive to be a conduit of his blessing to others. The word encourage means pour courage into. Strive to be a conduit that pours God's blessing into others. So as we close before the baptism, ask yourself, am I an example of the power of a thankful heart? In describing you, would people use the word thankful or grateful? Or would they say, you know, no, no, no. That person, always complaining, never satisfied, never thankful, 
Are you a contented Christian? Do others look at you and see that you have a peace that defies human explanation? Your contentment will draw others to the Lord. Let us pray. And as we pray, the baptismal candidates can make their way to the back there to change. Maybe you're here today and you have to be honest and say, I don't know the Jesus you're talking about as my Savior. I want to encourage you. You can have a relationship with Jesus if you'll pray in your heart a prayer similar to this, in the quietness of your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today, Lord, I admit I owe up to the fact that I'm a sinner and I understand that I need you to save me from my sin. I am sorry for my sin. I'm thankful that you went to the cross and gave your life, shed your blood to pay for my sin. Please forgive me. Jesus, come into my life and be my Savior. And I want to follow you as the Lord, the master of my life from this moment on. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you pray that prayer today, just ask you to slip your hand. I'm not going to point you out in any fashion. Yes, are there any others who say, I prayed. I asked Jesus into my life. Father, thank you for those that have said yes to Jesus and as a testimony of their decision to follow Jesus. We pray for those being baptized today. Thank you for the courage you've given them to stand up and to step out. And Lord, I thank you for the the joy that they have in following you. And I thank you there's all ages and all have their own God story of their journey with you. Lord, I pray that you continue to move and that Jesus is lifted up in this place today. In his name, amen. This is Brenda Edwards, and Brenda is just a joy. I got to talk to her for probably an hour, a little over a week ago, and hear what God's done in her life. She has her sister and husband and um, best friend with her. And so we're thankful to each one that they've come. And Brenda um, has liver cancer, mm -hmm. and she's had it twice. But what a testimony and, um, of, of faith and uh, peace. Um, but, and um, has a hard time getting around because <laughs> of the, all the chemo she's had. But she's like, I want to get baptized. And uh, it's a joy for me to baptize Brenda. I talked with her quite a bit. She's going to hopefully someday in the not too uh, distant future share her story with the church and how God's used her, and we need to hear that. Um, she's a small group uh, participant, and the small group's been one of her life savers for a great small group. Um, Brenda, you do know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, I do. Then is it your desire to be identified as a follower of Jesus through water baptism? Yes. And I baptize you, Brenda Edwards, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Testimony. This is uh, Abigail Bozerman. I'm going to call her Abby. Uh, she's in fourth grade at the Westmont Elementary School, part of our children's ministry. Her mom is a great worker with our Bible school, and uh, her mom and dad both do a great job working with our children. She has two brothers that make her life interesting, Nathan and Seth, and um, Abby... Uh, is excited for this moment. We talked before the service, and I'm going to ask you two questions, Abby. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? She's, yes. <laughs> your hearing's not bad. And is it your desire to be known as a follower of Jesus through water baptism? Yes. Okay. Then it's my privilege to baptize you, Abby Bozerman, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Still floating. 
This is Shirley Morales, and um, they come, they're the first ones here every Sunday at 11.15. Um, but Shirley was in the discipleship class. You want to take your glasses off. And, um, Shirley and her daughter, granddaughter, and uh, son-in-law come to the church, but we're thrilled to have Shirley. She knows and loves Jesus. She was just in the discipleship class, or Discovery 101 class last we can uh, had some great answers, understands the scriptures. Shirley, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? I sure do. Then is it your desire to be known as the follower of Jesus through water baptism? Yes, sir. Then I baptize you. I'm going to hold that man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Steve's going to catch you, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Then I baptize you, Shirley Morales, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Mark Hall, and uh, probably 10 years ago, I'd be like, who'd have thunk? <laughs> I've told this story, and I don't think Mark will mind. He's going to share his testimony sometime. <laughs> we were at a basketball game, ended up at the parking lot after the game. <laughs> Mark's like, do you want a piece of me? I'm like, no, Mark, I don't want a piece of you. The security guards came. Um, everything okay? I said, everything's fine. Mark called me the next day. He goes, I owe you an apology. I told Tony, I said, Mark was all bent out of shape. He goes, I'm shaking. That's my pastor. You can't do that to my pastor. God is in the miracle working business. Every one of us is a miracle. But I had the privilege of coaching Mark's son, Zach, a great, great kid. Both his boys are walking with the Lord, Zach and Matt, and that's a blessing. He's a rich man knowing that. But Mark and Lisa, his wife, are in the discipleship class. And um, this is my prize student. <laughs> it's just neat to see what God's doing. Sandy goes, I love Mark. I like the rebels that God takes and changes. So thank you. So Mark, you do know Jesus as your Savior? Yes, I do, sir. Is it your desire to be known as a follower of Jesus through water baptism? Yes, it is, sir. And I baptize you, Mark Hall, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Mark's taken some, uh, I don't know if they're self-defense course, so I made sure I brought him up. <laughs> This is Jim Babcock, James Babcock, and he's part of the group that comes early. And um, he also was in the most recent uh, Discovery 101 class. And um, we're just thrilled to have his family with us, part of the body of Christ. And I read Jim's story, and the Lord's delivered him from a battle that he had growing up in his life. And um, it was alcohol, but he's been sober for a long time now. And the Lord's delivered him and changed him. So I love what God does and how he changes lives. Jim, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Yes, I do. Is it your desire to be known as a follower of Jesus through water baptism? Yes, I do. Then I baptize you. And I baptize you, James Babcock, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Most of you know this is our associate, Steve. He's like a son to me, Steve Vickroy. We're thrilled to have him and Jen and the three boys with us. Um, Steve's going to close in prayer, and someday Steve's going to be doing this because I'm getting old, and he's, he's going to be doing the baptizing. But, Steve, if you close in prayer for us. Please. Sure can. Father, thank you for uh, 
your amazing grace and your love for each one of us here. Uh, thank you for these individuals, Lord, who have uh, publicly declared their, their love for you, Jesus, and uh, that you um, have changed their lives, and uh, Lord, you're going to continue to do that. So, Lord, I just pray for uh, for them to get plugged in here at the church, and uh, Lord, just pray that we as a as a body will come alongside them and encourage them to, to follow you, Jesus, and uh, we do. We thank you, God, for how you change lives and how you've uh, changed each one of us here. And uh, in Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.